One of my first memories of this room is from when I saw my then roommate Cornelia give her senior sermon during my first year of rabbinical school. Cornelia and I had only met at the start of the school year, yet in a matter of months, she became the only person I saw for quite some time. Coming to terms with the reality of COVID and finishing the already challenging first year of rabbinical school was difficult. When I anticipated my fifth and final year, I imagined that the world would look different, perhaps calmer even. Well, here I am in my last semester, and thank God we have vaccines and improved information about mitigation measures, but COVID is still with us. We're just coming off of yet another surge. And beyond the pandemic, the past few years have hardly been easy, with this academic year punctuated by horrific violence in Israel and Gaza. These conditions have not been what many of us anticipated or wanted. When we find ourselves in these unexpected and perhaps unwanted moments, do we just look for the light at the proverbial end of the tunnel? Or is there another way to understand being in the tunnel? This week's Parsha, Mishpatim, begins with the Israelites receiving a very long set of rules. Ve'ele ha-mishpatim asher tasim lifnehem, God said to Moses, and these are the rules that you shall place before them. Medieval commentators took note of the fact that the first word, ve'ele, begins with a conjunction, implying a connection between this week's Parsha and last. For that reason, Rashi suggests that we are picking up where we left off in Yitro, the moment of Matan Torah, rather than transitioning to some other story about legal transmission. Just as the Ten Commandments were given at Har Sinai, so too were the rulings about human interactions detailed this week. Parshat Mishpatim is a direct continuation of Revelation. In a famous rabbinic interpretation of the moment when the Israelites received the Torah, the Talmudic sage Rav Avdimi Bar Chama Bar Chasa said, the Holy One inverted Mount Sinai and held it over the Israelites, kagigit, like a tub or a barrel, and said, receive the Torah, or here will become your grave. Receive Torah and live, or die here under the mountain. The image of the Israelites literally standing under the mountain gives the rabbis of the Talmud, particularly Rav Ahabar Yaakov, tremendous pause. Wouldn't this mean that the Israelites accepted Torah under duress? And if so, wouldn't that undermine the very authority of Torah? Rather than seeking a solution in the story of Sinai itself, the rabbis fast forward to the Purim story. According to the ninth chapter of Migilat Esther, after the Jews successfully fought for their lives against Haman and his collaborators, they voluntarily accepted the commitment to celebrate Purim each year. The Babylonian sage Rava picks up on the language of this passage in the Megillah. Kimu the Kiblu Hayehudim. The Jews confirmed or reestablished and received the observance of Purim. And Rava transposes this to the context of Revelation. He teaches that in the days of Ahasuerus, the Persian Jews actually accepted not only the obligation to observe Purim, but also recommitted themselves to the entire Torah. Kimu ma shekiblu kfar, he explains. The Persian Jews affirmed or established what they had already received, meaning at Sinai. Thus, the difficulty with har kigigit is ostensibly resolved. Had we been concerned that the children of Israel were forced to accept the Torah at Sinai, we could rest assured that later, uh, at the time of Esther and Mordechai, they reaccepted Torah of their own free will. Ever since I first encountered it, this resolution struck me as a bit odd. While Kimu the Ki Blue was not an explicitly coerced moment, like the moment of Kar Kigigit, both acceptances occurred during or immediately following profound moments of disorientation and vulnerability. At Sinai, the Israelites were given a choice between Torah and death, says the Midrash. The moment in the Purim story when the Jews utter Kimu the Ki Blue comes after they have been saved but not by much. I have to imagine that the fear, disorientation, and perhaps even trauma of the Jews' encounter with Haman had not yet dissipated. To accept God's Torah after enduring such an ordeal is barely more a free choice than accepting it to avoid getting squashed by a mountain. 
The Torah of both Sinai and Shushan were received and affirmed in the context of extreme external pressure. We can learn from how the rabbis connected Revelation to these two destabilizing experiences that there is a direct relationship between moments of disorientation and receiving Torah. What if we understood Kimu Kiblu not as a tikkun or a pair to one of the midrashic understandings of Sinai, but rather as a testament to what it means to accept and live out Torah in our frequently uncertain and tumultuous world? Taking on this relationship to Torah and the world around us necessitates, first and foremost, paying attention to the here and now, even in difficult moments. Remember, God does not give the Torah at the end of 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, but in the midst of it, not at the peak of our power, but in a moment of vulnerability. If we do not stay present, remaining open to the possibility of revelation, we risk missing the unique Torah these experiences offer. What do I mean by unique Torah? What about the Torah, the one that has been passed down from generation to generation, from Sinai to Shushan to here in Willis today? From a certain perspective, of course, there is capital T, Torah. Yet, how we receive and understand and live out this Torah is informed by our particular circumstances. For example, the Torah the Israelites hear and to which they commit themselves after the experiences of enslavement, liberation, and, according to our sages, near death under Mount Sinai, is fittingly about interpersonal and communal justice how to create an equitable and life-giving society on the other side of enslavement. The Torah the Persian Jews receive, and to which they commit themselves after overcoming persecution, is not about leaving everything up to God, excuse me, is about leaving everything up to God, but also realizing that God is with us even when seemingly hidden. And the Torah that I have received over the past five years including how I understand the interplay between Sinai and Shushan, is similarly informed by and inseparable from what I have lived through. I chose to come to JTS craving and expecting deep Talmud Torah in the form of many hours in the Beit Midrash. By senior spring, I'd be able to tackle a Tosafot, no longer agonize over Aramaic. You get the picture. I even planned to have a master's in Talmud to show for it. Yet as courses went virtual, classmates came and went, and less time was allotted for skill building, I came to the realization that I might not be able to learn rabbinic texts in the way I had envisioned, at least not in that particular moment. I spent a lot of time angry, sad, and even grieving over the loss of an experience I had envisioned for myself. But I wasn't just going to focus on getting to ordination to the other side of school. Instead, I began to look for Torah in new ways. One professor suggested choosing a master's that allowed me to continue studying Talmud, but in a manner better suited to my reality at the time. So, I pursued a gender studies MA with a focus in rabbinics. As I began opening to the idea that my rabbinic education might have different contours than the ones I had envisioned, I was able to encounter other revelatory moments. Prioritizing interpersonal relationships, pursuing additional hospital rotations as a chaplain, and permitting the challenges and joys in my personal life to be teachers as well. The Torah we can receive in our moments of disorientation may not be the Torah we wanted or thought we needed, but it is deeply important. Yet as exemplified at Sinai and Shushan, and as I learned during my years at JTS, Matan Torah is not passive. We must make space for the grief, fear, and anxiety of destabilizing times rather than ignoring these feelings or being consumed by them, then perhaps we can experience the revelatory dimensions of these moments. In doing so, we can become present to profound truths. One Hasidic teacher, Rabbi Tzedok Kohen, even went so far as to say that the true miracle of Purim was as follows. The Jews of Shushan, precisely when they were downtrodden, were able to realize that it was a moment of divine concealment. They took action, crying out, fasting, and so forth, and their mourning turned into joy. If we follow this line of thinking, the Jews wouldn't have even had their Kimu Kiblu moment if they weren't honest with themselves about the depths of their despair. Torah is available to each of us, 
and in every moment, no matter what we may be going through. The challenge is for us to recognize and grasp onto it. After Sinai came Shushan, and after our current moment of disorientation, there will likely be another, and another, and another. The reality of our world is that there will always be tumultuous days ahead. But as Rabbi Ferris Bueller once said, <laughs> life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. Trying to get through difficult times as quickly as possible is a very human tendency. But if we allow ourselves to slow down and meet the moment, then we won't miss the Torah that life reveals. May we stay present, receptive to the possibility of revelation, even and especially when it's hard. May we merit to receive the Torah that we and our world so urgently need. It's very humbling to look out at all of you in this room and know many of the people in the Zoom room and to have so many people to thank. So as to not stand in the way of afternoon classes, I'll refer you to the pamphlets that were on some of your seats. Um, but I do want to just uh, thank Joe Blumberg for pinch hitting Mincha. Um, we have actually uh, President Joe Biden to thank as he is on the Upper West Side. Um, so in a way, you know, he was, he was here for the senior sermon too. Um, <laughs> And I also want to thank uh, Rabbi Michael Knopf, my senior sermon mentor. And I want to wish a very happy birthday to my chavruta, Sami Vingren. We'll conclude with the rabbi's Kaddish, after which you're invited to enjoy some treats. Thank you for being here. Yitkadal v'yitkadash shemei rabba. Be'alma divra kirite v'yamlich malchute. Bechayechon uviomechon uvchaye dechol beit Yisrael. Baagala uvizman kari viimru amen. Yehesh mamirah mamirah leavan uvamei amaya. Yitbarach viyishtabach viyitpaar viyitromam viyitnase. Viyitadar viyitale viyitalal shemei dekudesha b'richu. Leela min kol birchata v'shirata. Tush bechata v'nechemata. Da'amiran be'alma viimru amen. All Yisrael, the all Rabbanan, the all Tami Dehon, the all Kol Tami Deh Tami Dehon, the all Kol Man Doskim Beoraita, Di Vaatra Hadin Hadin Vidi Vecho Atar Vatar, Yehei Lahon Ulahon Shlama Raba, Chine Vechizda Verachamin, Vachayin Arichin Umizona Rivicha, Ufor Kana Min Kodam Avahon Divi Shmaya Vimru Amen. Yehei Shlama Raba Min Shmaya. V'chayim tovim aleinu v'yal kol Yisrael v'yimru amin. Ose shalom b'imromav, hu barachamav y'ase shalom. Aleinu v'yal kol Yisrael v'yal kol Yosheit Tevel v'yimru amin.